Before I start, real quickly with the fellows and the residents, who in their training programs is exposed to posterior foraminotomies? Open versus MIS? Pretty much everybody. That's changed. That, that, that's fairly, this is the first time I've spoke at this meeting, but over the past 10, 20 years, that's a, that's a change. I like to see that. Uh, getting started, I appreciate Yin's getting the, the North Carolina lunch delivered today. That was very typical. How many pieces did you have? I had one. I'm, I'm reining it in. Um, disclosure, spine wave, uh, not applicable to this talk. Um, start off with just a case of, of interest that may be close to home to, to some of us. 55-year-old uh, ophthalmologist that I've known for a while, shows up with a two-month history of worsening left arm pain, neck pain, occurred during an Ironman event. Um, he just kept getting worse. His weakness kept getting worse. Um, was messing with his ability to operate. He had a trial of a Medrol pack. He had a P did some PT. We actually did an epidural um, and really never got any significant improvement. See if I can. Oh, that is really cool. Um, just a, a lateral soft disc herniation. Um, it's taken to the OR, a left 6-7 MED. It was outpatient basis. He got back into his office three days post-op, started operating seven days post-op, and I had to kind of tie him down to wait eight weeks to, to get back to his triathlon training. Um, this is a, a diagram that we put together with the first paper. Um, but it really shows kind of what we went through yesterday, demonstrating the foraminotomy at the end result uh, and kind of the bony resection. Now, just kind of focusing on some of the indications and selection criteria, um, not all pathology is treatable from a posterior approach. And, and this became, even though it's the older, older approach for cervical spine pathology, it was really the, the introduction with Cloward and then Smith-Robinson that you could treat everything via anterior approach. So you, there wasn't a necessity to have a back uh, approach early on. Unfortunately, and this is something we've already talked about this weekend, 25% of those folks would then go on to require further surgery within 10 years. The current system I use is really based off the original lumbar MED system that Kevin Foley and Mo Smith uh, introduced to us via, uh, at that time, sophomore Danik uh, in 1997. Um, I was able to work with them and modify it for cervical usage that, that same year. Uh, we published our original experience in, in JNS Spine in 2001. And I'm going to throw in a lot of NFC competitor pictures here for Jens to, um, I think there's even some Seahawk pictures. Uh, current clinical indications. Unilateral radiculopathy. This is not a treatment for bilateral radiculopathy. Uh, it may involve one or more levels. Uh, as Jens asked the other day, I, I've, I've personally never done three levels in one setting. I've done two levels in one setting, uh, and I really do rely a lot on selective nerve blocks to, to discriminate that. Looking for, for signs confirming dermatormal patterns and motor deficits just to give you confirmation. Look for absence of concordant reflexes. And, and I always get asked about neck pain. And, and neck pain that's associated with the onset of the radicular symptoms is normally a result of the radicular symptoms. So if somebody has a 20-year history of hideous neck pain and then they develop arm symptoms, I'll usually not put them through a foraminotomy. There we go. Good, good picture of Luke Keekley. Uh, contraindications, as I mentioned, bilateral radiculopathy. Um, any signs of myelopathy. There, are, there is a professor in Japan who's got a great series of, of um, myelopathy decompressions done with this technique. He's got bigger balls than I have. Uh, I haven't done that. Do you know uh, Yoshida, Minuto Yoshida? Yeah. Um, also, a contraindication, history of a prior foraminotomy. If, if there's no bone covering the nerve and you're trying to go back and go through that scarred soft tissue, you're going to get the nerve. So uh, I would strongly discourage anybody from doing that after the, the surgery is healed. I have done it in the first three or four weeks with an early recurrence. Radiographic in indications, spondylotic change. And there's a lot of spondylotic foraminal disease that results in radiculopathy that doesn't have cord involvement. 
uh, frequently you go to CT scan to show this and, and it just jumps out at you better. I don't know, maybe if I was better with reading MRIs, I wouldn't have to do that, but, but that was the same as the last MRI scan. Um, foraminal disc herniation is a, is a great indication as I showed in that first case. Um, one of the rules of thumb that I utilize, if the, let me go to this pointer again, if the apex of the rupture is at or lateral to the edge of the spinal cord, not the, not the thecal sac, it's safe to get to from behind. If, it, if you see that question mark, or not question mark, but comma mark to the spinal cord with the paramedian rupture, I think the risk of reaching under there is too great that you're gonna displace the cord. Uh, and, and one of my major complications was not recognizing a, a progression of a big disc rupture um, that ended up being a huge central disc rupture that, that delivered as a big chunk and, and caused a problem. Can I ask you a question? If you, go back, if you go back one slide, if you just uh, stay on. Um, when you see foraminal stenosis that goes that far anterolaterally, um, how, how much can you still get from a foraminotomy approach? So if you, let me go back to the, I keep hitting the wrong button. So if you, if you figure that you got to get to the lateral aspect of the body, okay, that it's gonna start opening up from there, that still leaves you with about 50% of the facet joint. Sure, uh, radiographic content, contraindications, alignment abnormalities and, and instability, very important in Charlotte is the NASCAR community. Um, again, going over the radiographic contraindications, uh, spondylotic stenosis, central, cord with, or central disc with cord compression, and, and I frequently will get a myelogram if it's in doubt. And, and the more spondylotic disease, the less clear you are sometimes on, on what levels are really significant. Additional indications, uh, Jack and I were talking about some of these earlier. Prior ACDF, I get sent a fair number of, of patients and some, for some reason Atlanta, there's a lot of residual radiculopathy after ACDF. Um, and they end up coming to Charlotte for foraminotomies, but they don't do that well. It's uh, some reason that that chronic, even though it's EMGs positive, it's still they don't do that well. Um, adjacent level disease, it works very well for if it's if they're presenting. Uh, and then to go back to the all these pictures I've included, I've had very good success with ath athletes, especially in the NFL and NASCAR over the years. Um, and and they kind of seek themselves out there. That's an interesting group of people to work with. Uh, and then, Jack, as we were talking about, a prior total disc arthroplasty. Um, Dom Cork's one of my partners. He does a ton of, of disc arthroplasties. And, and we've probably done between us a dozen post-arthroplasty foraminotomies. And it's, it works well. I mean, they, we still spare them having to be fused. Uh, they're just showing up with, with unilateral radicular sy symptoms um, sometimes five years later. Description of the technique, as I said yesterday, I do do this in the sitting position, I use a Mayfield Keys head holder. I'm incredibly spoiled now. We have two RAs that have done 2,000 of these at our surgery center and they, you, they call you when they're positioned. I bring the C-arm in from the front so I have the ability to do intraoperative lateral throughout the course of the procedure. And then to kind of emphasize again what we talked about yesterday, I start with the K-wire, I always dock it at the base of the spinous process. That then allows me to find out how medial versus lateral I am. If I can get to the back of the facet, I know that I'm lateral enough. Then I go up to the sequential dilators. One tip that's very important when you get the first dilator in, and a lot of you are comfortable putting tubes into the lumbar spine, I'm sure. There's two layers of fascia and the deeper fascia in the neck is the harder one. Um, so there's a variety of things that some people will stick a knife all the way down. I try not to do that. I'll usually stick a hemostat or, or fine tip scissors closed along the first dilator and just spread the fascia deeper so that the next series of dilators are, are easier to pass. Um, and you can see it at the finish, go ahead and dock the, the tube over the back of the disc space, which will, will mimic where the foramen is. I then begin to palpate, especially with that first retractor, or first dilator, I'm sorry, um, the step of the facet. I want to slide from the inferior articular process 
down to the superior articular process and I feel that pop going back and forth. And that really gives me confidence that, that I'm on the right part of the, of the facet to go ahead and do the exposure. Really, you want to be careful with that medial lateral placement because of the, the risk of getting into the inner, inner uh, laminar space and into the canal. Um, if you wait until you go down to, over the disc space with the last two dilators, they're too big to fit in there. Let me go back a second here. I didn't mention this shows the, the setup um, for the surgery itself. We've got, actually, we now have a different monitor set up at the surgery center, but um, I have the ability to, to see the, the fluoro image and the endoscope image, image at the same time, uh, which is really helpful. Just kind of allows the surgery to move quicker. Kind of the steps of the procedure, soft tissue preparation, followed by the foraminotomy, followed by the discectomy if it's indicated, and then the closure. Um, here's a, a video. Uh, this is a right 6-7. Get the soft tissue exposed. Use the confirmation with the fluoro to know where I am. Start drilling kind of like I did yesterday. This is very edited. Um, find that little window over the lateral canal, which you can see right there. Start with the two kerosene, rotate it laterally, and begin to, to create the foraminotomy. Find the medial wall of the pedicle, find the top of the pedicle, extend the foraminotomy out. You can see the nerve root in view there. Uh, this is a very satisfying large fragment we'll take out here. Open the residual ligament. And then pull out a very large fragment, which is always fun. Um, and then inspect and make sure there's nothing else around there. But you can see the, the root well decompressed at this point. I didn't say no bleeding. <laughs> and and one, of the, one of the tricks that can be helpful is if you, uh, your entry point from the skin, if you have a little uphill slope going to the, to the facet, it never obscures your view. Um, so this is a, uh, I went back and looked at, at the first thousand once we got finished and, and we were able to identify um, about 750 or 780 of them, contact them and then through any kind of retrospective analysis you lose different, you know, some people will answer some questions, not other questions, but we'll go through kind of what, what, the, uh, what the results of a lot of that were. But I had 93% were one level, 7% were two level, no bilateral procedures, as I'd noted. Um, typical surgery time now for me is about 20 to 30 minutes for this. Average age of the patient, 48. We do them well into their 80s now. And an interesting breakdown pathology, 46% soft disc herniation, 54% spondylotic. I can't tell on pre-op imaging if I'm going to find a, a, a soft fragment or not. It's, it's just not that easy. Uh, occasionally, you can really get a clear-cut idea that you're going to have an extrusion. Uh, distribution of the levels, as you can see, expected five, six, six, seven. Um, seven, one is, is fairly common and, and very easy to deal with from posteriorly. So of our initial thousand, we got 565 responses. 91% would have the surgery again. 87% felt that it fulfilled expectations. 86% were able to return to their pre-radiculopathy activity level, including employment. And this did include workers' comp patients. 94% um, had their weakness returned to baseline. 91% numbness returned to baseline. Uh, the numbness that persists in some of these folks will be like the pad of the finger, or the tip of the thumb is, if it's a C6 root. 92% um, neck pain returned to baseline. Uh, and this is one of the more uh, interesting things from my perspective is the return to work or full activity for, for folks that, uh, you know, the homemakers, et cetera. Um, as you can see, almost half within a week are back to their full activity. Uh, and within three weeks, 75% are back to full activity. And you can tell we, we kept the workers' comp in this series. Um, again, um, I don't know that there's anything... Yeah, here we go. 85% were off of all prescription pain medicine in three weeks. Now, this series I closed, the first thousand was a few years ago when I closed this out, and it was pre-opioid crisis. So 
it's even lower now. <laughs> they, get, they get five days of narcotics and that's all they get. Um, I put this slide in for, for comparison's sake. And I did a moderate amount of open foraminotomies before I uh, switched to the endoscope approach. Um, and on the left is a five-year post-op foraminotomy. Um, and pay attention to the semispinalis cervicus. I wish Dr. Tubbs was here. He could help me with that. Uh, now look at this one. This was another one of my own patients done before the MED introduction. And look at the difference in the muscle belly here versus here. Sorry, this thing's hard to put where you want. So I would say it's maybe a third of the size. And, and really, we see a lot less muscle disruption, muscle atrophy. And it's, I think it's because we're not detaching it from midline, from the, the spinous process, the bottom of the lamina, out to the facet joint. We're really just working. I'll take out a plug of muscle, and it's all multifidus. Um, and that's what's covering that segment that I have to get to. Looking at the major complications, there were three cases. One, Brown's a card. That was the result of that giant central disc that I didn't recognize. She, when I saw her before the 4th of July, she was unilateral, radicular symptoms. I operated on her a week later and didn't realize that she had developed bilateral radicular symptoms in that interim. She was asleep before I uh, saw her again, and I delivered what well, felt like a baby coming out from under the cord, and that was a bad feeling. Um, I've had one C8 reflex sympathetic dystrophy. That was from trying to get out a soft disc fragment. <laughs> that I should have just left alone. And one wound infection out of the series requiring secondary operation. Minor complications, about 3%. Six dural tears early in the procedure. I'll get a dural tear now once a year or less. Um, they're no big deal in the neck. You put a little Duragen and Evacil in there, and I don't change anything. You just, they're, I don't recover them differently. I don't change your activity. It's, it's kind of at that zero point for, for CSF pressure, um, so it hasn't been an issue. Uh, 12 minor wound infections that required just oral antibiotics. Five cases, almost 1%, that had some increased radicular weakness that went on to recover within six months. Uh, and one case of segmentation anomaly where I ended up operating on the wrong level, not recognizing a clipophile off of the, the MRI. Uh, comparison now, posterior anterior, this is what Jack's been waiting for. Um, they're both surgeries. They both involve uh, inf infection risk, hematoma risk, durotomy risk. There's no risk of dysphagia from the back. Um, there's risk of nerve root injury. There's risk of, of instability. Um, now, the, I always get asked about air embolism from doing these in the sitting position. We've, we're tracking now and starting to get the, the into QOD data together. Um, on, on 2,000 foraminotomies that we've done in our, our outpatient center that opened in 2012, we've had zero incidents that we could have attribute to any kind of air embolism. Um, there's the, the hypotension that is noted is the hypotension of when you sit them up. Um, and, and our anesthesiologists will usually hydrate them well before we, we position them upright, and that's pretty much a non-issue. But the thing that it does eliminate for us is we don't have a risk of sewer arthrosis, hardware failure, esophageal injury, um, recurrent laryngeal injury, uh, the, the slew of things that we're all familiar with on the anterior side. Um, now, when we looked at the, the subsequent surgeries, um, about four years to recurrent, or to, to subsequent surgery, sorry, uh, varying from four weeks to nine years. The four-week deal was a, a trauma surgeon from, from the D.C. area um, who had a huge 6-7 soft disc that we took out. And I guess he was feeling good enough that he called me back about four weeks later and described a, uh, a long evening with his new girlfriend and things didn't go well and he had recurrence of his arm symptoms and he had spit out another, another disc. Um, but he was soon enough that I just... I reopened the incision, put the tube down, and it came out, and that was, that was the end of that. Um, now, if we break it down to same level reoperations, um, 
overall about 8% had, I came back and did an ACDF at, at the treated level. Um, 16 of the 284 that I treated for soft disc herniations um, had recurrences, so 5.6%, 5, 5 sorry, with a mean of about 2.8 years. And I'll come back uh, and talk about that in a little bit more detail. Uh, then we look at the spondylotics, 23 um, had been treated for, for just spondylotic foraminal stenosis and they required uh, repeat surgery and this was a little bit later. But it was interesting we, when we broke down this data, the soft disc herniations tended to occur earlier in the follow-up and the spondylotic recurrences tended to recur kind of uniformly throughout the follow-up period over the, over the years. Same level reoperation rates. Some of this data I think we've, has been presented already this weekend. Um, in my series total, 8.3% between 5 and 15 years. When we broke it down into soft disc versus spondylotic, it was 5.6% versus 9.5%. This is comparable to the 5% of, of Clark um, at 10 years in, in the 2007 paper, the 4% at two years uh, in, in Pickett's early disc replacement surgery. And the ACDF series was 9.7% from Kaiser in 2002. Then we look at adjacent level surgery. Uh, about 3.4% of cases have required adjacent level surgery. The, the bulk of those were treated with MED, uh, and three of them had required ACDF. And I can't remember what that slide was for. Now if we look at the adjacent level reoperation rates, uh, current series was 3.4%, an open series from Clark in 2007, 6.7%. Uh, another open series, a big one, huge one from Henderson, 5.2%. Um, total disc replacement series of Grasso's, 5%. Uh, and then the ACDF rate that we're all familiar with, the 25%. In conclusion, cervical foraminotomy is effective uh, and useful to treatment of, of cervical radiculopathy. It's effective for both soft discs and spondylotic stenosis. Has a lower rate of subsequent surgery than ACDF. Complication rate is low, and it's routinely done on an outpatient basis with no implant costs. Now, it, it's interesting, and I do about half of the cervical work I do is anterior. Um, and that just it really shows that this is not a, a procedure that everything can be treated through. Um, but if somebody can be treated with a, with a posterior foraminotomy, I, I will do them that way. And in, in my practice of now, 34 neurosurgeons, everybody's doing that. Um, and it's interesting also because we're, as we go more and more into these bundled, plan, excuse me, bundled payment programs, um, we get paid the same whether we do a foraminotomy or an ACDF. Um, so it's all of a sudden become a lot more sexy to, to do the foraminotomies. Thank you.